All right, while you are coming in, a uh, couple of things to lay in front of you. Um, uh, some have to do with prayer requests and things. I am sure you have followed some of the flood damage in Florida on uh, the television and whatnot. Uh, we have sister churches down in that area, and um, one of them is uh, just a little bit north of where there was some big time trouble. And it is a church that we are gonna to use to funnel benevolence funds through. Uh, the deacons will send some down immediately. But what we wanna do is we wanna set aside a Sunday later in October where we will take up a special offering and add to that and send down a second wave of uh, funds. The uh, reason we do that, we like to work through local churches. Um, it is much more efficient to have hands-on people who are right there, who know how to distribute it and know what the needs are, uh, rather than some bureaucracy from the outside doing whatever they think is necessary. And so if you could plan on that, uh, that would be good. And also, I'm not going to use her name, and I'm not gonna use the country that she is from, but we have been praying for a certain lady who has been uh, detained and imprisoned uh, waiting her trial um, in a communist country. And uh, that took place this past week, and she was sentenced to two years in um, labor camp. And the crime that uh, she committed was that she held up a placard with a Bible verse on it. If anybody thinks communist countries are worth living under, they don't know a thing about what they're talking about. Um, uh, they are cruel, they are unjust, and they are atheistic from the foundations up. And so, uh, numbers of you know her name and uh, the name of her husband, and so we want to continue to keep uh, that in prayer. And uh, we've got a number of other announcements that we'll make later today. But it is important for us as we gather together, we want to re-plug in ourselves. Um, this is kind of like a church history kind of an emphasis. We've been watching Michael Reeves inform us on the English Reformation, and today he will get into the theology of the Puritans, which has got a soft spot in many of our hearts um, with that. Uh, our brother Dale Johnson will be here this Saturday, so file that away. 10 o'clock Saturday morning, we'll only have two uh, lectures in, the, in Saturday. Um, we'll be done by 12.15, 12.20, something like that, but it won't be uh, a, a long drudgery kind of day. He'll be here for Sunday school next Lord's Day. Um, Joe Bartimus uh, will be preaching for us. Um, uh, Joe Bartimus preached for us last year on that um, weekend. And so this is kind of all circulating around matters of church history. And so when we come together today, it is important for us to kind of attune ourselves to the needs of uh, what is current in our age and what the past can teach us with respect to it. Uh, because it staggers me so much as to how every generation has to be encouraged to learn from what God has done before. Um, it's kind of like every generation is slow, and so that. As he introduces this, um, let me read to you out of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you want to grab your Bibles, I'd really like to read this whole chapter, uh, because I think this captures the essence of what the Puritans were all about. Now he's going to go into a number of things with respect to all the misconceptions about Puritanism and some of the prejudices against the Puritans and uh, some of that and he will try to get us to have a balanced view of the Puritans because if all you do is read Puritan pastors, which is basically all that we do, is we read Puritan pastors, you can very easily set a pedestal um, 
for the, those men and idolize them and that's not fair to them that's not biblical and that's not what god wants us to do he wants us to see the good and the bad and he will try to give us some measure of balance with respect to that but when it comes to the heart and soul of what puritans wanted to do first timothy 4 uh, i think puts it into at least a biblical nutshell for us now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and to doctrines of demons. This is the context in which the Puritans were raised. They're speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth, for every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. For, biblical ex or for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach, and let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And the, the spirit of what the Puritans were after is, is in that. In times of compromise, in times where the truth of the gospel was at risk, God raised up generations of men and he put inside of them something of the fire of real truth. I think that may be a good summarization of what the Puritans were all about. Calvinism set on fire, you know, and there's a beauty about it. So let's pray, and then we'll listen to Dr. Reeves as he uh, speaks to us. Our Heavenly Father, we want to bless your name, and we thank you for the mercies that you have given to us in our day. We thank you for the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and we thank you for the power of that truth that transforms minds and lives. Now, Father, as you have moved in every generation, and as you have always had your people, we are grateful for the privilege of remembering them in our past English heritage. So we ask for their, your guidance. We pray for your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. In this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to press in a little bit to see who were these Puritans. Who were they? Now, Puritan, the word has always been more of a weapon than a real description. Uh, for the very small minority today, Puritan is used as a description of a united golden team with impeccable spiritual theological credentials, something that's not strictly true, as we'll see. For the vast majority, though, the word Puritan is verbal mud. 
you throw it at someone and it makes them look like a laughable, lemon-sucking fool. Uh, the sort of, you know, the frozen chosen, baptized in vinegar. H.L. Uh, you know, Mencken put it, he said, Puritan is the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. There's that, there's that very negative view of Puritanism. And the word was coined originally as a term of abuse shortly after Elizabeth became queen. So for the average Englishman, there was the papist on one side, and then there was the precisionist or Puritan, those were the two terms, who went too far in the other direction. The English like being the sort of golden mean in the middle. And this term Puritan, it suggested a nitpicking holier than thou sort. Um, who considered themselves purer than the rest, who were much too precise and pernickety. Now, this certainly wasn't a fair description. People who thought they were purer than the rest, their um, descriptions of themselves, clearly they never thought of themselves as purer than the rest. Uh, their, their constant testimony to their own sinfulness demonstrates that. But neither was it a very precise description the Puritans could differ, a recognized Puritan could differ from another on a whole host of different issues. They were quite a broad and varied bunch. And so the word Puritan is about as accurate a description as the word evangelical today. You can mean quite a th few things by that. And so Recognized Puritans could disagree with each other over what the cross was about. They could disagree how to be saved. So John Owen, who we'll, we'll come to see in a moment, disagreed with Richard Baxter, another major Puritan figure, over the cross, over what justification meant, over uh, the nature of the Christian life. John Milton, the poet and author of Paradise Lost, he was an undoubted Puritan, but Milton almost certainly didn't even believe in the Trinity, God of all Christian creeds. And if that's the case, well, who were the Puritans then, if they could be that diverse? Well, perhaps John Milton put it best when he spoke of the reforming of the Reformation. So Puritans were not those who thought they themselves were pure. It was that they wanted to purify what in the church had not yet been purified and what in themselves had not yet been purified. They wanted reform. And while they had some different ideas as to what that should look like, the Puritans wanted to apply reformation to everything, to themselves, to the church, to the country, to everything it hadn't touched. So they thought the reformation was a good thing but unlike Elizabeth, they thought it wasn't over yet. It wasn't complete. Now, before seeing their story, some of the mud that's been thrown at the Puritans needs to be wiped off a little bit so we can get to know them. Now, for one thing then, who were the Puritans? They didn't even look like what we tend to think they looked like. And this helps because visually you picture a Puritan and you feel you've got a good idea of what they're like. So we tend to think of the gaudy puffed sleeves of the Elizabethan period, the beautiful bodices, the, the jolly ruffs and doublets of the laughing cavaliers. And then you've got the Puritans who wore black and scowled. And, and that is often how their portraits showed them. But you need to know a couple of things. Virtually nobody smiled when their portrait was taken because you had to hold that pose for days and it was a formal thing. And also the reason they wore black was because that was their Sunday best. It's wearing a suit to be smart for a portrait which is going to last for years. But on other days they wear all the colours of the rainbow. So John Owen, perhaps the greatest Puritan theologian, will come to meet him. He would walk through Oxford, we are told, hair powdered, 
cambric band with large costly band strings, velvet jacket, breeches set about at knees with ribbons pointed, and Spanish leather boots, so oh, he loved his Spanish leather boots, with, with cambric fancy lacy tops. And they weren't a crowd of inveterate sourpusses either. One author put it like this, he said, contrary to popular impression, the Puritan was no ascetic. If he continually warned against the vanity of creatures as misused by fallen man, he never praised hair shirts or dry crusts. The Puritan liked good food, good drink, homely comforts. And while he laughed at mosquitoes, he found it a real hardship to drink water when the beer ran out. <laughs> now, bluntly, to say what all Puritans were like is going to be misleading, given what a varied bunch they were. And so, of course, some were quite glum. Uh, William Prynne we'll hear of in a bit. William Prynne once said, Christ Jesus, our pattern, was always mourning, never laughing. You think, OK, doesn't seem to be much room for Christ's language of his own joy there. But what's true of one Puritan isn't necessarily true of the next at all. Uh, so, we'll be meeting Richard Sibbs in a bit, and something I found out is there are only, I think, a couple of 17th century portraits that I've ever seen that show someone with a twinkle in their eye or a bit of a smile. One of them is Richard Sibbs, one of the leading Puritans. Now, testimony to his enormous amiability shining through even a portrait. Now, what can be said, a concession I'll make, is their zeal for reforming all of life could make many of them a little pedantic. They could often be very, very detailed in how they wanted to speak of something very particular. And so you read a Puritan and they will quite often go on a bit. They'll really cover a ground quite thoroughly, more thoroughly than we're used to. But the most important trait that really unites all Puritans and the one that makes them so misunderstood is this, their passionate love for the Bible, for Bible study, for listening to sermons. And again and again, we read of Puritans happily traveling for hours to hear a good long sermon, how they thought an evening's Bible study was better than an evening's dancing, and how they loved a good long sermon. Uh, sermons of up to seven hours long were not unheard of. Happy days, eh? <laughs> Thinks a preacher. <laughs> uh, Lawrence Chatterton, who the extraordinarily long-lived master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, which was a real nursery of Puritanism. He lived to be over 100. And Lawrence Chatterton, he once found that he'd been preaching, and without noticing, he found that he'd been preaching for two straight hours at which point he paused and apologized to the people. And the people shouted back, for God's sake, sir, go on, go on. Such eagerness there was to hear the word of God. Now, to people who've never experienced the Bible as something exciting, at best that sounds boring, at worst it sounds deranged. <laughs> but think about it, Europe had been without a Bible that people could read for something like a thousand years. And to hear God's words and in them see such good news that God saves by his grace alone. It was like a burst of Florida sunshine into this gray world of relig religious guilt. It was intoxicatingly attractive and alluring for people. And really to fail to understand that love of the Bible makes it impossible to understand the Puritans. So take, for example, an account of a typically Puritan event, a sermon preached by roaring John Rogers of the pretty little village of Dedham. Um, I say pretty, I spent much of my childhood in Dedham. My grandparents lived there and they're buried right by Rogers' uh, pulpit. And he was known as Roaring John Rogers because he could be quite a character in the pulpit. He would, for example, he'd personate the screams of the damned in the pulpit and so on. He'd be quite a character. And here's, here's, one, um, here's one episode recorded for us by a young Thomas Goodwin went out to hear him from Cambridge. And 
And here's his recollection of hearing Rogers preach. Goodwin recorded that in a sermon he went to hear, Rogers fell into an expostulation with the people about their neglect of the Bible. So soon, neglect of the Bible. And he impersonated God to the people. Rogers liked his impersonations. And as God, he addressed the people, telling them, well, I've trusted you so long with my Bible, you've slighted it. It lies in such and such houses covered with dust and cobwebs. You care not to look into it. Do you use my Bible so? Well, you shall have my Bible no longer. And he takes up the Bible from its cushion and, personating God, walks away with it. Then, Rogers immediately turns and impersonates the people addressing God and says, Falling on his knees, crying and pleading most earnestly. Listen to these words. Lord, whatsoever thou dost to us, take not thy Bible from us. Kill our children. Burn our houses. Destroy our goods. Only spare us thy Bible. Take not away thy Bible. And then he personated God again to the people. Say you so. Well, I will try you a little longer, and here is my Bible for you. I will see how you will use it, whether you will love it more, whether you'll value it more, whether you'll observe it more, whether you'll live more according to it. And by these actions, he put all the congregation into so strange a posture, Goodwin said he'd never saw any congregation in the like in his life. The place was like the Valley of Bokim. The people generally, as it were, deluged with their own tears. And Goodwin told me, said the recorder, that when he got out, he was, when he was ready to take horse again to be gone, he was fain to hang about a quarter of an hour upon the neck of his horse, weeping before he had the power to mount. So strange an impression was there upon him, and generally upon the people, upon having thus been expostulated with, for the neglect of the Bible. Now that story is quite incomprehensible without appreciating that for the Puritan, as the new coronation service said, the Bible is the most valuable thing that this world affords. Words that are still said in the coronation service of every English monarch. Puritanism was about reforming all of life under the supreme authority of the Bible. And that was something that would put the fear of God into the authorities. But I want to look at an internal tension that Puritanism as a movement faced. See, the whole story of the Reformation in Britain, I hope you've been able to see a little bit so far, was that it was so easy for Protestantism to become a mere political party. By a good way into Elizabeth's period, it had become all too simple to be zealously anti-Catholic and yet to have no understanding or experience of God's grace. For when just about everybody went to church, it was entirely undemanding to be nominally Protestant. Everyone did it. And this is what the Puritans fought. They urged people to a personal reformation. The Puritans wanted a reformed church in England filled with hearts that had been reformed. And so in, Purit in the Puritans, you get to see a group of pastors and theologians who saw themselves really as heart doctors, concerned with the inner workings, the inner lives, the secret lives of their people. And that meant a group of pastors concerned with what their people loved, what they desired. They wanted to know, did their people love the Lord heartily? Or were they just nominally acting out the Christian life? Now, that fight had a considerable danger. And I wonder if you can think what that would be. And it was a danger for 
Puritanism's sister movement in Germany, Lutheran pietism. And it was this, the desire to have people respond to the gospel could lead to a focus on the response, not the gospel. So in looking for reformed lives, the sign that a person had responded rightly to the gospel, it was easy to let a concern for a focus on growth in personal holiness eclipse a focus on justification by faith alone, the message that will actually transform lives. In other words, the danger for the Puritans was that they could be tempted to concentrate on holy living in response to the gospel instead of focusing on the gospel, which will promote holy living. And thus, the experience of many churchgoers could be that they would hear a sermon on the Ten Commandments, they'd hear lessons about the need for holiness, but they wouldn't hear about Christ's free gift of righteousness. Meaning that many then acted as if their salvation depended on their holiness of life, Luther's original problem. And this could all be coupled with very strong warnings about the dangers of damnation. And these could be very strong. So the great Cambridge Puritan preacher William Perkins, it was, it was said, we're told, he would pronounce the word damn in such a way as would leave a sad echo in his listeners' ears a long while after. So strong warnings people would hear, but if they weren't coupled with hearing of the free saving grace of Christ, then people were forced to a morbid introspection sniffing around inside themselves to see if their heart felt good enough or to see if there was any faith in there that they could trust in, so trusting in their own faith and not Christ. And it was just here that some of the Puritan ministries that are still most refreshing came in with a cure. So the men will be focusing on Richard Sibbs, Thomas Goodwin, John Owen. They all saw this danger and tendency around them. And they preached into it with a glorious perception and insight. In fact, in the next lecture, we're going to meet a man saved by Richard Sibbs from this morbid, self-dependent religion. We're going to get to know Sibbs a little bit next, but I want to introduce you to the sort of things that Sibbs would preach. Two people struggling with self-dependence, morbid introspection, depending on themselves before God. Here's the sort of thing Sibs would say. He would say, often think with thyself, what am I? A poor, sinful creature, but I have a righteousness in Christ that answers all. Oh, I'm weak in myself, but Christ is strong, and I'm strong in him. I'm foolish in myself, but I'm wise in him. What I lack in myself, I have in him. He is mine. His righteousness is mine, which is the righteousness of God, man. And being clothed with this... I stand safe against conscience, hell, wrath, and whatsoever. And though I have daily experience of my sins, yet there is more righteousness in Christ who is mine and who is the chief of 10,000. There is more righteousness in him than there is sin in me. See, he's preaching that Christ clothes sinners in his own righteousness and entirely against the idea that sinners need to make themselves holy in order to be saved, which assumes that God is not actually being gracious but simply rewarding people for their effort. Sibs preached a most gracious Christ. So he asked his people this question, do we entertain Christ to our loss? 
does he come empty to us? Isn't that a good question? People so naturally fall into thinking that we're the ones doing him a favor. Does he come to us empty? No, says Sibs. He comes with all grace. His goodness is a diffusive goodness. He comes to spread his treasures, to enrich the heart, to bear all afflictions, to encounter dangers, to bring peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost. He comes, as it were, to make our hearts a heaven. Consider this. As this fountain has the fullness of a fountain, he strives to empty his goodness into our souls. He comes out of love for us. And Sib saw it's only like that when you see the glory, the graciousness of Christ. Only then do you seek not to buy him off with works. Then you seek him because you desire him, your eyes haven't been opened to him, then you find he becomes more attractive than sin to you. When you know how he loves, you begin to love, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. And so Sib saw himself as a chef holding out the banquet of Christ's delicious grace. Let me read you a little bit. One last bit from Sibs. He said, we see, we cannot please Christ more than by a cheerful taking part of his rich provision. That's what pleases Christ, receiving his grace. It is an honor to his bounty to fall to. It is the temper of spirit that a Christian aims at to rejoice always in the Lord. And he asks, what will we do for him? if we'll not feast with him. We won't suffer with him if we won't feast with him. E.g., you won't do much for Christ if you don't love him. He must be lovely to you before you will do much for him. We will not suffer with him if we will not joy with him and in him. Therefore, friends, that which we should labor to bring with us is a taste of these dainties Christ offers, an appetite to them. The chief thing that Christ requires is a stomach to his dainties. Let that be an appetizer for you. In our next lecture, we'll have a proper meal of sibs. Thank you. Isn't that delightful? I, I think you cannot hear something like that without wanting to not just read the Puritans, but to uh, know the Christ that the Puritans had. Um, what stood out to you? Anything jump at you? Because there are a number of things I think it's important for us to imbibe. Andy? Well said, Andy. Um, the, the fact of reality is there is in our fallenness, in the corruptions of our mind and of our thinking, there is a legalism, a pride, and a self-righteousness that is always on the verge of rising up. And if you are attuned to what is going on between you and Christ during the day, you will find yourself almost flipping back and forth between a man of grace who relies entirely upon the righteousness of the finished work of Jesus Christ, that that seals the deal when it comes to your covenant relationship with God and that it is by pure, sheer grace that you are saved. And then you'll find yourself flip into a little Pharisee, into a legalist, 
that says, ah, I'm not good enough to approach Christ today. I am not what I ought to be. My unworthiness is pushing me away from Christ. And the power of the gospel is, no, no, no. Um, that's a false religion. That's earning your way with God. That's denying grace. That's not walking by faith. That's walking by what you see in yourself. And the, the beautiful genius of the gospel, and you know, the Puritans were not the first ones to do it, and they're not the last ones to do it, they're not the only <coughs> ones to do it, but the genius of it is, no, I give you a great Christ, a Christ who is far greater, far more perfect. In fact, I remember almost thinking when I was struggling as a young man for the assurance of salvation, the way that Sibs put it, almost paraphrased it recognizing how much sin there is in me, and then thinking the thought, there is more to the righteousness of Christ to save me than there is of sin to damn me. And to cast yourself upon that is beauty. It is freedom. It is liberty. But I guarantee, if you are serious in your walk with Christ, you will find constantly that stupid little Pharisee that lives on the inside of you rising up and condemning your sin. Instead of driving you to Christ, it makes you wallow in your unworthiness. And so, amen, hallelujah, thank God for preachers of Christ. You know, so, very well said, Andy, good. Other things? Dwayne? You uh, <clears throat> made the remark about the, um, why there was so much enthusiasm No, I was thinking the same thing. You know, maybe it's a little bit of an overstatement, but familiarity breeds contempt. And what we take for granted, uh, we ought not to take for granted. You take it for granted, uh, you will lose it. Um, I don't know about the histrionics of that one preacher, <laughs> you know, um, the guy who was impersonating both God and man. Um, and uh, I can't see most of us in this century ever trying to do that. Um, um, but the sentiment needs to be there. The reality needs to be there. How often have we heard through this church history series the vital importance of the word of God? You know, over and over again, what has brought the revival? What has brought change to lives and to movements? And what has saved, th it has always been a resurgence of the availability of the word of God. You know? And you know, to live at a time, to live at a time when we could not endure a two hour sermon, you know? um, to live at a time when um, you know, if there is something better on TV, that's where our appetites run. Um, and, and not to have the same appetite or the same yearning, burning desire for the truth of God's word, um, that is something of a commenta commentary on where we are. And it is something of a commentary on why the church is where it is. The hunger and thirst for the truth of God's word that's the evidence of the regeneration of the heart of a man. When he so changes what we delight in that it becomes to be what God delights in. You know? And so we've got that whole kind of a thing about the emphasis on the word of God, which was the heart core center of Puritanism. You know? And that's what got them into trouble with the Church of England. You know? Church of England, you say sola scriptura, but you don't live it, you know. You, you don't just bank on it. You begin to manufacture your own traditions, your own rituals. You do your own thing, and you're not serious about living according to the word of God entirely, you know. And so that got them in big trouble. It will always get us in big trouble, you know. So at any rate, good. Other things stood out to you?
Let me remind you here of First Timothy. No? And again, when I read this and without the background of uh, what he was going to say, you can only come so far with it. But you're able a little bit better to put yourself in the context of it. Uh, Paul is talking to Timothy as a young man. Timothy is not inexperienced, but chronologically he is a young man. And he says in verse 6, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. See, and this is the Puritan emphasis on personal reformation. You know? Their idea was the Reformation must always be reformed. And that went not just for an ecclesiastical level of, of the church, but it goes for the personal level. The yearning desire to grow to the image of Christ. And that requires the word. He says, reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself for godliness. And then here you get the Puritan passion. Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. And that entire pouring of your life into the godlikeness that is the beauty of what it is to be saved to be like God you know, in those ways that we can be like God. You know. That's the passion that drove Puritans. Jump down. These things command and teach. That's verse 11. Verse 12. Let no one despise your youth because it's not important about the instrument that God is using. The man is nothing more than a channel. You know. And so... Don't let anybody undermine your authority just because you're young and in their eyes wet behind the ears. But be an example. We're going to hear about this in preaching this morning. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. That is quite a spectrum of things to be an example of. Not only moderately rise to some level of achievement in these things, but with heart and soul, with feeling and with passion, you know, these things are to be eminent in the minister of the gospel. He says, and here he gets public, till I come give attention to reading, that's why we read the Bible. That's why we read scripture in our worship. Because he's talking here about public reading before the congregation. Give attention to reading, to exhortation. That's why we preach. And to doctrine. That's why we teach. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy and the laying on of hands of the eldership. And then... Here again, you can see the Puritan passion. Meditate on these things. Yeah. These are to fill your mind. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be apparent to all. Yeah. In other words, I was reading in Proverbs, um, probably like some of you were doing yesterday, was Proverbs 1. You know. um, Today was Proverbs 2, you know, where Proverbs 2 says, if you seek wisdom like silver, if you cry for it like something that you desperately need, you know, then wisdom comes from God and God will give you wisdom. In other words, the lazy, the superficial, the people who do momentary fits and passions about looking at things, uh, they're going nowhere. Meditate. Give yourself entirely to them. Then your progress and your growth will become apparent to all. You know? And that's the Puritan emphasis. Take heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Continue in them. 
For in doing them, you will both save yourself because there is no salvation without sanctification. And you'll save those that hear you. Those that will hear you will hear the truth. And that truth will set them free. So it is a good biblical background and foundation for what the Puritans were trying to do. So anyway, uh, comments, questions? Now I know reading the Puritans is not new to most of you. Um, but let me commend it. All right? um, and he is right. Um, well, well he, he's an expert, so, so, so he is right. They can be difficult for our culture to read. Um, but if you take those Puritan paperbacks, oh, Louise was telling us about the one that she's reading uh, Wednesday night. If you take those Puritan paperbacks um, that the Banner of Truth puts out, uh, they will make them a little bit more succinct, um, put them in more of a comprehensible radius so that you can grab a hold of the gist of them, and yet they will grab your attention. Um, because he was pointing out Puritans became physicians of the soul and of the heart. They not only understood the truth, but they understood the application to it to the internal part. And they had to fight through their own sin to find the Bible's solutions and the Bible's answers to things like pride, covetousness, anger, hypocrisy, all of those things and all the deceptiveness that the flesh will throw up at it. And they became beautiful expressors of not only what's wrong with us, but what's in Christ that counters it and stuff. And you will find them hitting your soul. You know? um, I remember, um, doo -doo -doo. not too long ago, and we were giving it out at the fair, um, used to be called Elaine's Alarm to the Unconverted. Um, and we've got copies back there, they've changed the titles to A Sure Guide to Heaven. But if you wanna see the real work of what it is to be born again, uh, that is excellent. I can remember reading to one of the young people in church at length. We met every Sunday night before the evening service, and I read to them Richard Baxt read to him Richard Baxter's Call to the Unconverted. And if you ever want to hear the pleadings of somebody yearning for somebody to come to Christ, I commend to you Baxter's Call to the Unconverted, that and Elaine's Alarm. Spurgeon used to have his wife read those two books to him Sunday evenings after church. And his comments were, oh, those books, oh, those books. You know? um, so at any rate, um, if you are uh, very familiar with the Puritans, or if you're totally unfamiliar with the Puritans, we highly commend your reading of those things that have been reprinted. Okay? Closing word, questions, comments? Dwayne? Oh, yeah, yeah. You have to go slow sometimes, but it is true. Oh, good word, good word. Yeah, when, when you read a Puritan, um, it is not bad to read two pages at a time. Put it down, meditate on it, underline, make notes about it, because uh, what they can cram into a paragraph is remarkable, um, and it, it is amazing. Um, so don't say, all right, I'm going to finish this book this week. Um, let it feed your soul, and so we commend that. So good word, Dwayne. Good. Any others? Anybody have a favorite Puritan book? Mm. Influential one. Um, the Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment by Jeremiah Burroughs is back there. I saw copies of that back there. That was highly influential um, when I was young. Uh, again, Richard Baxter, and he's right, he's going to show Richard Baxter's fallacies with his doctrine. Um, what they have done is they have reprinted his practical works. Um, and when it comes to practical works, I, I have heard that eventually he got his doctrine straightened out later in his life, but his practical works are magnificent. He wrote one called
the saints everlasting rest. And it is <laughs> wonderful to read, it's life changing to read. Uh, but at any rate, very much encourage you, pick one of these guys up, read thoughtfully and attentively, and you will be blessed. So let's pray together. God, our Father, we do wanna thank you for the heritage of Christ that you have put in the English language. Thank you for the work. Thank you for raising up these blessed gifts to your church. We ask, Lord, that you would do that again this day. How badly the church in America needs these kinds of serious, heartfelt, godly men. And we pray that you would raise up a number of them. So we ask, Lord, that you would work with us this day, make progress in that direction. In Jesus' name, amen.